with Juan Gonzalez. And welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Protests are continuing in Haiti over the cholera outbreak that has now killed over 1,100 people and infected more than 17,000. On Wednesday, residents in the city of Cap Haitien clashed with U.N. troops for the third consecutive day. Crowds have taken to the streets, expressing anger at the Haitian government and the U.N. for failing to contain the disease. Nepalese U.N. troops stationed in Cap Haitien have been accused of inadvertently bringing cholera to Haiti. The protest reportedly started at a cemetery where cholera victims were being placed in mass graves. At least two people have been killed in clashes between demonstrators and U.N. troops. On Tuesday, the U.N. mission in Haiti, known as MINUSTA, said aid flights have been canceled and water purification and training projects curtailed, while food at a warehouse has been looted and burned. The Pan American Health Organization told Agence France Press that the cholera outbreak could kill as many as 10,000 people and cause 200,000 infections in the coming year. Meanwhile, the disease has spread beyond Haiti's borders. The Dominican Republic confirmed it had detected its first case of cholera, and officials in Florida have confirmed the first case in the United States. For more, we go to Haiti right now to speak with independent journalist Ansel Herz. He's in the city of Capacien, where the protests are taking place. Ansel, welcome to Democracy Now! Tell us what's happening in Capacien. Right now, I'm facing the downtown public square here in Cap Haitian. It's the second largest city here in Haiti on the northern coast. And things are, appear to be pretty calm here in the downtown. Uh, today is actually a holiday. It's National Flag Day, and it commemorates a huge battle uh, that was waged in 1803 in, in Haiti's independence struggle. But as I came into the city yesterday, um, there were barricades almost every every couple hundred of yards um, on the main highway coming into Cap Haitian. Uh, there were young men as well as women uh, around a lot of these barricades. Um, I had a few rocks thrown at me, but as I got closer, uh, I flashed my press badge and, and I tried to make clear that I wasn't with the UN peacekeeping mission. And immediately, I was I was sort of hustled through a lot of these barricades, and they're actually still in the streets. Um, a lot of them are, are not manned at the moment, but I people are saying that because today is is this national holiday commemorating uh, Haiti's independence struggle, they they expect the protesters to come out again in the next few hours. And I'll add, too, that uh, reportedly a third person has been killed by U.N. troops here in the city. That happened yesterday. Um, I actually went by a, a back street here in Cap Haitian where protesters had dug a trench as a, as a barricade, basically, and a Minusa vehicle, a peacekeeping vehicle, fell into the trench. And I'm told by witnesses and, and by Haitian journalists here that uh, when the vehicle fell in, uh, Chilean peacekeepers sort of came under um, attack, I guess, or a barrage of uh, bottles and rocks to the population, and that the troops responded with gunfire and, and shot an innocent young man uh, just in his house. And so, reportedly, they, they took his body over to the, the mayor's office, actually, and left it there. Um, and, and again, meanwhile, there are still barricades here in the street, and, and some of them are actually made of coffins. Um, and, and protesters told me that there were there are caller victims inside. We're asking uh, listeners and viewers to bear with the uh, phone sound, but we just think it's absolutely critical to get this information out of Cape Haitian or Cap Haitian. Juan? Well, Ansel, I'd like to ask you, in terms of it's clear that the U.N. peacekeepers, if they were the, the, the source and likely were of the outbreak of the cholera, didn't do it uh, deliberately, but there has been a growing uh, resentment uh, for years now among the Haitian people to UN the presence of UN peacekeepers could you talk about the the roots of this uh, of this animosity I mean, it's been interesting to see how the U.N. has responded to these riots because they, and, and protests because they've actually claimed that people are sort of being manipulated into this, that they, it's not a, a legitimate sort of spontaneous political movement. Um, but, of course, I was here in this city a year ago, actually, and I was interviewing people on the street, and they were telling they were protests at that time, peaceful protests against U.N. peacekeepers, um, and they were telling me that they were tired of, of an occupation in their country, that the, the peacekeepers have an enormous budget, but very little of it is spent on, you know, concrete humanitarian activity to actually improve education and health care uh, in this country. And, and of course, also back in August, a young boy, a 16-year-old boy, was found hanging from a tree inside a U.N. peacekeeping base here in Cap Haitien. Uh, that, that's a story that's been totally ignored by 
basically the entire U.S. media um, and U.N. troops claim that he committed suicide, but people just across from the base at a hotel said that they heard his screams, they heard that he was being strangled, um, and, and there's a lot of suspicion that he was, in fact, murdered by peacekeepers for, for maybe stealing a small amount of money. Um, and then recently a group of civil society organizations wrote a letter to the U.N. peacekeepers demanding an independent investigation and condemning what they called uh, the, the U.N.'s obstruction into justice uh, for, for that case. And, and after that death, there were, there were weeks of pro protest, peaceful protests here in Kapaikin. So the idea that these are, these are sort of manipulated um, protests, that the people are being used, I, I think doesn't hold water. Uh, there have been long-standing accusations against the peacekeeping mission here for for abusing um, patients and, and for lacking transparent investigations into, into alleged human rights violations. And, and what about the uh, upcoming elections and uh, and uh, the difficulty of holding an election, uh, given the uh, the calamities that have uh, befallen Haiti in the past year? I mean, there was a recent report from Terracon that uh, thousands and thousands of people who died in the earthquake are still on the voter rolls. But of course, the cholera epidemic is spreading. Um, it's been epidemic basically throughout the country. It was allowed to spread out of the central region where it began and is now in all 10 of, of the provinces. And, you know, even before the, the cholera outbreak began, you had uh, very regular protests in Port-au-Prince by um, people in the tent camps, people who have been displaced for the past 10 months, who lost their homes in the earthquake and, and have not been given any kind of new housing. And, and their rallying cry again and again has been, we are not going to vote while we're under tents and tarps. Um, and, and so I think the prospects for holding a credible election where you have uh, considerable participation are, are pretty low. Uh, of course, the, one of the largest parties in the country, Sami Lavalas, the party of the ousted president, John Bertrand Aristide, who was overthrown in a 2004 coup, that party is being totally excluded from the election on what, what appear to be just political grounds, and, and it's been part of, of excluding that entire movement uh, since Aristide was ousted. And, and so I, I just think this election is, is likely to be a sham affair. Uh, and yet, the candidates, as well as the Asian government itself, are insisting, and, and the United Nations as well, are insisting that this election is going to go forward on November 28th. Uh, finally, again, uh, the United States holding back more than the U.S. Congress holding back more than a billion dollars in aid to Haiti. What is the effect of this, Ansel? Uh, is that you have at least 1.3 million people still living in these, in these tent camps where independent studies by um, the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, as well as others, have found that you know, 30, 30 to 40 percent of these camps don't have any regular clean water, uh, don't have toilets. Um, and, and so, you know, I've heard people say that Haiti is unlucky to be hit by cholera, that it's, that it's somehow um, sort of a, a tragedy that couldn't have been prevented. But the fact is, you know, NGOs, uh, private charity groups, raised billions of dollars in, in relief uh, funds for earthquake victims after the after the January 12th earthquake, and very little of it has been spent. Uh, just one example is the, the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund, headed by President uh, Clinton and Bush. It was inaugurated by President Obama right after the earthquake. They dispersed only six million out of uh, around 50 million dollars that they raised, and and so. humanitarian crisis on top of Haiti's uh, decades of poverty, and, and it doesn't seem likely to end anytime soon unless there's a really serious reevaluation of the way NGOs, in, in tandem with the United Nations, operate in this country. Ansel Hers, we want to thank you very much for being with us. Independent journalist has lived in Haiti um, for more than a year. Uh, he's speaking to us from Capacien, from Cape Haitian in Haiti. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report back in a minute.